but today I'm from the Adler Planetarium, and I'm here to talk to you all about citizen science with the Zooniverse. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen share and show you a few slides. All right, let's go ahead and do that. Let's just screen share. All right. So I hope you're off to a good start to the day today. And hopefully you'll be seeing my slides in just a moment. There we go. So I'm just going to do a quick check back to see if you've got volume. I would hate to go on and on. You don't actually. All right. Great. So hopefully you'll have, be mic'd soon. So again, my name is Kelly Borden, and I work at the Other Planetarium in Chicago. And I'm here to talk to you today about Zooniverse. Um, and Zooniverse is a collection of online citizen science projects from across a variety of scientific disciplines. Uh, about half of our projects are astronomy-based, and about half cover other scientific disciplines from biology to ecology. We even have a couple of humanities projects in there. Um, we've been around for about seven years. Um, we've only started doing educational outreach as part of this uh, for about the last two years. So I thought I'd give you an overview and share some of our different projects and resources with you today. Um, I think the best place to start with the story is at the beginning. Um, so about seven years ago, in the tranquil town of Oxford in the UK, at the University of Oxford, um, there were several astrophysicists sort of um, mulling things over in the pub one night. And something to know about astrophysicists is that there aren't very many of them, and they have a lot of data to deal with. Um, and these particular astrophysicists were interested in studying the formation and evolution of galaxies. Now, very simply stated, to understand how galaxies form, you need to classify them according to their shape. And you need to classify a lot of them. But that sort of presents two problems. One is that there's just too much data. Um, as with many other scientific disciplines, data collection methods um, for um, astronomers have almost gotten too good. So um, instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey just have too many images. There are literally millions and millions of images of galaxies and not enough professional astronomers or free graduate student labor. Um, I think I heard once that there are about 6,000 professional astronomers in the world, but most of them aren't particularly interested in galaxy morphology. It's a pretty small field. So at the pub one night, these astrophysicists decided, were trying to figure out a way to, that they wouldn't have to look at images of galaxies for the rest of their lives. Um, so what they decided to do was to crowdsource the problem. Um, now the way I usually define crowdsourcing, when I, particularly when I'm working with students, is to say that it's taking a really huge problem, like classifying a million images of galaxies, and breaking it into small pieces that everyone can help out with. Um, to, this basically addresses two questions. One, that they need to figure out if this would actually work, they would not have to classify galaxies for the rest of their, their lives, would be one, would anyone else want to do this? And would those people be any good at it? So um, hopefully you have a mic now. Um, I, this part I was hoping to get a little bit of feedback on, but that's fine. Um, but basically, um, I'm assuming that most of you don't have uh, PhDs in astrophysics. I know that I don't. But when you're looking at galaxies, you're primarily looking at their shape. So I have images of two different galaxies right here. We have galaxy one right here, and we have galaxy two here. Um, now, one of these galaxies is, an, is a spiral galaxy, and one of these galaxies is a smooth elliptical galaxy. So I was hoping to actually be able to have you clap and vote on this, but since we're having some audio issues, we might not be able to do that. Um, if you think galaxy one is a smooth elliptical galaxy, um, you would be right. It's actually very simple to tell. Um, and galaxy two is, of course, our spiral galaxy, which is very simple. This galaxy is very similar to our very own Milky Way. And so the second question is, so it turns out people are actually, you don't need any specialist knowledge to do this. Um, the second question is, would anyone actually try this? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the, in order to crowdsource this problem, they created a website called Galaxy Zoo. And I thought I would just show you quickly what Galaxy Zoo looks like. Um, Galaxy Zoo was launched in 2007. And basically what you are presented with 
is an image of a galaxy. You're always looking at the center galaxy. And then you have a couple. Let's see, I have a. Mm, Sorry, I see that I have an incoming video. Okay, it looks like. Sorry, I was getting a notification and I thought maybe we had been disconnected. I apologize for that. So you can see that you have a very simple um, galaxy and what you are looking at is, is it smooth? Does it have features or a disk like the spiral galaxy? Or is it a star or an artifact? And in fact, it is smooth. And I would say that it's sort of in between those sizes. And if you're not sure what you're looking at, you can always um, go ahead and hit the Help tab, and it will give you some additional information. There's nothing else out here, and I would not like to discuss that object. So that's very simply how Galaxy Zoo worked. And what we have learned is that it turns out It works well. We have had approximately 40 peer-reviewed papers come out of the Galaxy Zoo data. Um, over a million galaxies have been classified, each by multiple volunteers. Each image is looked at by between 20 and 40 volunteers. And we're looking for the consensus answer as to how to classify that particular object. And what's been even more exciting um, are the sense of serendipitous discoveries. So we found some things we didn't expect to find. Um, so these little blobs up here, they, sort of, they look like little green peas, which is sort of what they're called. And turns out these are a new type of galaxy discovered by our volunteers. Um, a volunteer noticed one in an image, posted it in the Galaxy Zoo Forum, which is a place where volunteers and um, scientists can interact, and said, what is this? And the astronomy team said, well, it's, it, it's a blip, it's nothing. Um, but that user was not convinced of that and enlisted other Galaxy Zoo volunteers to create a collection of these objects and presented their findings to the astronomers who said, wow, you've really found something. And it turns out it's a new type of galaxy. And so these serendipitous discoveries are something that we're looking for in all of our projects. Um, so in the past seven years, after the success of Galaxy Zoo, um, the Zooniverse has expanded. Uh, we currently have 17 live citizen science projects, four more are in development, um, we currently are sitting on a pile of proposals from science teams for other projects to build, so we'll be continually um, expanding our offerings. I thought it might be interesting if I share just a couple, quickly, a couple of the other uh, Zooniverse projects that we have. Uh, this is the Zooniverse team. Um, it's comprised of developers, educators, and designers. Um, most of us are housed at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, but there um, is still a small development team at the University of Oxford. So these are the folks that create them. Uh, this project is called Snapshot Serengeti. It is um, all about exploring predator-prey dynamics in Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. So the science team sets up uh, camera traps. There's about 220 of them. And they're attached to a motion sensor. So when something walks by, it snaps a picture. So you can see in this one um, that I did last night, um, I had some zebras. Um, identify the type of animal, answer a couple of questions about their behavior, and submit my classification. And this project has been incredibly popular. I facilitated this with students a few times, and it's always um, it's always a good one. Uh, this is one of our more well-known projects. It's one of our astronomy projects, obviously. And I think that this one has sort of the sexiest science case. We're asking people to help us discover new planets orbiting around distant stars. Um, so what you're looking at is data from the Kepler Space Telescope, and that data is publicly available. And what we're looking for, what this is a graph of, is um, the uh, apparent brightness of a star, so how bright different stars look. And what we're looking for are very small dips in how bright that star appears. Um, what that means is, what that could mean is that a planet is orbiting around and transiting that star, making it the, dimin the, the apparent brightness diminish just a little bit. And what's really exciting is that we've discovered two new planets. Um, using this, um, uh, two confirmed planets. Um, the first of those, PH1, um, it turns out to be in a, in a system that astronomers didn't even think was possible. Um, we have about 35 other planet candidates that our volunteers have identified that are awaiting confirmation through other observation methods. Um, I couldn't resist showing you a project that's not quite out yet. 
Uh, this is Plankton Portal, and in this project we are looking to um, understand the lives of zooplankton better um, to, as a way of uh, gauging marine health. And what's really exciting about this project is that um, normally when you collect plankton, it's with nets, so it kind of becomes this congealed jelly mess. And so you lose a lot of important information, uh, behavioral information. This detection method that the, that the science team developed um, is very new and very cutting edge because it actually capture, captures the zooplankton in situ. So we get a lot of really interesting and valuable information about their behavior. So um, based on the markings, um, you, you are mark, you're identifying the type and also marking the size. But based on the marking and the orientation of the animal, we can tell sometimes if one is hunting the other, one is fleeing the other. So that behavior element is pretty, pretty great. So as I said, um, Zooniverse projects are first and foremost science projects. Um, all Zooniverse projects require that um, the data has to be looked at by humans. We'll never build a project that's really cool, but that the data could be analyzed in another way. Um, that will always be the primary, meaningful science outputs will always be the primary goal of Zooniverse projects. Um, but as I said, about two years ago, we began developing some educational outreach components for these projects. Uh, the most simple of which um, is ZooTeach. Uh, ZooTeach.org is a website. It's a, a, a place where we invite educators and teachers to share lesson plans, activities, ways that they're using these projects in their classroom. Um, it's very much in its infancy. Um, there's a lot of good content on there, but we are rapidly trying to expand what is available on there as we're developing new projects and as we're developing new ways to incorporate these into the classroom. And as you can see by the, my screenshot, you can search by topic, you can search by age, range, lots of good stuff. Um, one resource that we're hoping to share on ZTeach very soon is called the Planet Hunters Educators Guide. Uh, we received some funding from JPL to create um, a series of nine lessons for sixth through eighth grade students to build understanding on the science behind the Planet Hunters project that I quickly showed you just a minute ago. Um, this is currently in evaluation. Um, should be completed by the end of the fall. We're actually looking for a, a few middle school teachers to um, do some second round evaluation and do a, a second read over, read through, and give us some comments on those lessons if you're interested. I'll give you my email address at the end of this presentation. Um, Galaxy Zoo Navigator is a, is a very much a project that came out of Need Expressed. Um, my colleague Laura White and I have gone to several meetings over the last two years. We've gone to NSTA. Um, the Association of Science Education Annual Meeting over in the UK. And one thing we heard a lot from teachers was that they wanted tools to help engage their students a bit more deeply in the data that they encounter on Zooniverse. Um, the Navigator is a great way to do that. Uh, you can link to this directly from Galaxy Zoo's homepage. And the Navigator basically allows functionality for a teacher to set up a group. So uh, you can have all of your class classifying as a group, and what you're effectively doing is creating a subset of data that you can then work with a little bit, um, separate from Galaxy Zoo. Those classifications are thrown into the Galaxy Zoo main pool, but you're able to sort of do a little bit of basic data manipulation. And the Navigator is divided primarily into two parts. This is my galaxies. And this is allowing you to look at, to compare how you classify a galaxy to how other people classify a galaxy. So if we look at this one, um, AGZ 000414K, looking at it, it's obviously a spiral, which is just another way of saying it has features or a disk. And the yellow color is the color that I classified it as. And you can see that 31 people all saw this, and 28 of those 31 said that it was a feature or a disk galaxy, which means that it probably is. And I think looking at it, you can see that that's pretty obvious. So this is really a nice thing to show students if they're worried about um, getting the wrong answer. Because of course, in Zooniverse, in Galaxy Zoo, in Citizen Science, there is not a right or a wrong answer. We're looking for the consensus answer because we've learned that that's probably the most accurate. Another thing that the Navigator allows you to do under the graph data section is to delve a little bit deeper. You can make some very simple plots um, using either your data as a group or you can use Galaxy Zoo data as a whole. You can either do a histogram or a scatter plot. Um, there's different metadata associated with each thing, so you, we know the redshift for each of the galaxy images um, or how far away it is. We also know the color. And you can choose to investigate those smooth ellipticals or those uh, feature disk spiral galaxies. And I know a lot of statistics teachers are using this tool for um, for just that in their math class. 
So if we move on. Um, we're also um, delving into the world of teacher professional development. Um, two weeks ago, we hosted a workshop called the Zooniverse Teacher Ambassadors Workshop, where we had 20 educators from around the country come to the planetarium, go through Zooniverse boot camp, and then they are going out, and they'll be creating some resources, new resources for ZTeach, new activities, new lessons, all kinds of great stuff that we're looking forward to sharing with everyone this fall. Um, for time's sake, I think that I will wrap up now. Um, this is a different tool that you can use. It's very similar to the Navigator. It's called ZooTools. It allows you to look at data in lots of different projects. And so if you have any questions, um, I would love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach um, all the educators at education at Um Our Twitter handle is ZooTeach, and we do have a blog where we talk about stuff from time to time. So let me get out of this, and hopefully I can maybe take some questions. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Great. So um, let's take any questions. I can see now that I'm back that um, we can. No, is Zooniverse, I see, um, is Zooniverse just related to astronomy? It's not. I'm actually, um, if you go to the homepage, Zooniverse.org, um, you'll see that about, about six or seven of our projects are astronomy. But as we said, we do have, um, oh, this was asked a while ago. I do apologize. Um, um, we do have lots of other projects um, that are coming out that are not based on astronomy. We have a, a number of um, biological projects as well. Um, any other any qu other questions? I apologize for not seeing this before since I was in screen share mode, but this question was asked about 12 minutes ago. Great, thank you so much. I hope that you all enjoy the event today. I really do wish I was out in New Jersey for this. So um, again, if anything does occur, um, you're certainly welcome to an, uh, email me directly. And I'll type that email address in right here. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.